Back when we started these shakedown films, I promised you guys they wouldn't always be Aston Martins. Well, there certainly ain't no Aston Martin, and it definitely is not Fluke Plus Blue. So, let's try something different. Instead of screaming through the canyons, why don't we go for a leisurely drive across town? Perhaps stop somewhere along the way and take in a little bit of Los Angeles local flavor. Okay, so we're off, and we have 33 miles of range. I topped off the charge as much as I could. There's like one bar missing. Now we're down to 32 miles of range, but here's the catch. We only have to go 19 miles, or at least that's how, as the crow flies. But in Los Angeles, it's kind of like an indirect route of freeways. So we're gonna take somewhat an indirect route because I wanna show you guys something. We get into our first spot of traffic. Now this is a new thing for me. As a filmmaker, I just don't like shooting with cars around us. You know, that's the normal deal that you see in life, is you're stuck in traffic. Like, this idiot behind us is, like, right up my ass. Um, but I don't want to see that when I'm in the imagination world of film. When I'm in this, this world that I create, I want it to be just me, the car, and the road. And that's it. But we're doing something different. So we're doing a real-world test, which means I'm going to cut off this truck. That was fun. Oh. Now you're seeing my real New York side. Now we're getting on the 405 south. I know that sounds a little odd. We're going south to go north. But as I said, we're going a little bit of a roundabout way because I want to show you guys something. Oh, and I think we need to set some ground rules here. Now that we're going to get up to speed here, uh, let's, let's cut this mini off. Let's do that, you know? Come on. We're driving a Cadillac, man. We're in the future. We are not going to drive this thing like a tree hugger. We drive Aston Martins, man. We drive S63s gonna drive this thing like a man. Now here's a picture you'd only see in Los Angeles. A Prius, a Volt, a Leaf, and my ELR. Kind of like the greatest hits of the EV world. Which brings up a really important question for the two women that watch this show. If you saw a guy drive any of these, would you be at all sexually interested in him? At all? Let me know in the comments below or hit us up via our social networks. Moto Man TV, all one word. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So on one of these ramps from the 405 to the 105, any of you that live in Los Angeles or have been to Los Angeles, these can be very fun, especially in the middle of the night when there's nobody around. But granted, we're an electric car, and we got a lot of traffic, but let's still have some fun. It's not bad. It's a little bit of lean in it, but then again, think how much extra weight is at the bottom of this car. Now that's an interesting point. You don't have that feeling of the car being unbalanced going through even a mild turn. Like, for example, the Kia Optima Hybrid. It's just not balanced well, because the car is a gasoline car that's been adapted for a hybrid. And they can tell you stories about how they, they envisioned it as a hybrid right from the get-go. If you drive that car, or even similar cars to it, they're not developed like this. This thing was designed to be an EV slash hybrid, and that's evidenced by this very long console. The batteries are here. They're not underneath the car, they're in the middle of the car. And by putting the batteries here, it's like the old school American underslungs back like 100 years ago. Those were the first car to really be at the road height of cars today. And it looks a little weird because they have huge wagon wheels on them. But the whole idea was to put the engine below the wheels and thus change the look and the overall handling characteristics of those vehicles. This is kind of the first one of its type, an EV slash hybrid thing, that does the same thing. Remember I said I want to show you guys something? That's the something. Um, that's both SpaceX and Tesla. So that's the headquarters for SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. And it's also the design center for Tesla. So that's where Franz and the crew, Kimberly Marty, remember our friend Kimberly Marty from the Acura film? Well, now she's been at Tesla for a while. She does color and trim there. Hi, Kimberly. Okay, so passing Tesla it brings up the obvious question. And I know anything you've read or seen about this car, everyone kind of says the same thing, and I hate to do it because I kind of pride myself in coming up with my own opinion. This is a neat car, it's beautiful. This, the, the design is really stunning, because after all, they came up with this as a concept car. This was the Converge back in the day, and they made it into a, a real car. Granted, the proportions 
of the Volt platform don't fit well with this body. It looks a little truncated. I would say this would look better on a much longer, more elegant platform, but that's me being a design freak. As neat as this car is, and it's, you know, it's screwed together well, the materials are nice. Uh, I don't really like leather, suede, and wood together. I'd like to see either just leather and wood and at, at that open pour wood like they do in the CTS or suede and wood, but this is, it's like they're going out of their way to say, hey, look, these are real materials. That's great, but don't beat me over the head with it. Less is more here. But overall, I can't help but think how much this car is. And it kind of has that CLA effect. The CLA effect is, are you really gonna buy a high spec Honda Accord or Toyota Camry or something like that now in the 30s, mid 30s, when you could buy a Mercedes CLA? The same kind of effect happens here where are you gonna buy this for 75 or as it's equipped is $80,000 and not even a sunroof, $80,000 or would you buy the Tesla. I personally would love to say the Cadillac because I think it's a better looking car and, I, and I'd love to say no to Tesla because they are incredibly hard to do business with but I can't, I literally can't argue they have built a fantastic mousetrap. So you're probably wondering why the helmet's here. Well let's just say that we're not going on a trip to nowhere. We're going to drive another car and let's just say that it's not an EV and it's not gonna be on public roads. Okay, so now we're on another freeway exchange, but this one has a little bit of a history to it. Did you guys ever see the first speed? Sandra Bullock with a bus and everything? Um, remember the scene where it jumped the uh, freeway the, that was under construction on the on-ramp, or over-ramp, whatever you wanna call this thing? That was shot right here. Okay, so now we're coming into downtown Los Angeles. And I gotta tell you, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit here, but I used to watch reruns of LA Law. And as a kid growing up in New York, man, it's like this magical place where it's 75 degrees every day of the year and it's sunny and they're handing out blondes at the airport. So that whole opening sequence of LA Law where the Jaguar trunk closes and you see the LA skyline, well, here's the LA skyline. That building used to be the first interstate bank tower. That was my first bank when I was in uh, college, going back many years. And now I'm driving a Cadillac. Although back in college, A, I'd never thought I'd ever want to drive a Cadillac, much less drive a Cadillac that's screwed together really well, and then a Cadillac that's super cool looking, and oh, by the way, is an EV. Now getting into downtown, this is the unpredictability of Los Angeles. I'd love to sit here and show you traffic because I was going to demonstrate this regen thing of the paddles on the steering wheel, but of course, there's no traffic when you want it. So let's try to make our own traffic. Let's go behind this van here. Um, so if I want to try to put some energy back in the batteries, I can do that without actually stepping on the brakes. There are these paddles, steering wheel paddles, kind of if you've driven a Cadillac XTS or even the, uh, actually there's different paddles in the CTS, but it's, they're the same paddles on the XTS. Basically you pull any one of these, the one on the left or the one on the right, and it actuates the brakes with an eye towards putting energy back in the batteries. The brake lights don't go on, so don't use it as like a makeshift brake because people will rear end you. Um, but the idea is, let's say I'm driving down the road here and I see someone coming in my lane of traffic, rather than hitting the brakes, I can do this regen thing. Now you gotta keep in mind, you gotta change your, 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 the way you drive, because you're not gonna do this in stop and go traffic, otherwise you literally are gonna have people up your ass. It's more in a situation like this, which is, I don't know what's more rare, that we're driving an EV in downtown Los Angeles, or the fact that we're driving an EV in downtown Los Angeles without any traffic. Okay, let's do a range check. We're just getting to the north part of downtown Los Angeles and we have 16 miles of range left. Okay, kids, we're gonna get off here and we are going to explore a little bit of Los Angeles history. What's more American than a Cadillac? Well, besides a Chevy, a Ford, and apple pie. I guess the fifth most American thing, baseball. Now, riddle me this. What is more controversial than the price of energy? Which is the reason why this car exists. Give up, Chavez Ravine otherwise known to you today as Dodgertown. The story goes somewhat like this. Back in the late 40s, there was a push 
in the entire U.S. for affordable housing. So much so, Congress appropriated funds in 1949 for an Affordable Housing Act. And that basically stated that uh, cities could take money from the federal government and buy land to create affordable housing. Well, Los Angeles decided this would be that area, Chavez Ravine. Uh, there was only one problem with that plan. The residents of the area, mainly Mexican immigrants, were like, we don't want to leave, even with the eminent domain money. Would you want to leave your home? Uh, so there were a number of legal challenges, and even outside of the courtroom it got very ugly. Uh, and that lasted to about the early to mid-50s, which is about the same time that the fear of communism spread throughout the U.S. And anything that smacked of communism, even remotely, was quashed, such as this affordable housing bill. So the residents here said, hey, or the ones that were actually left, like, hey, we won. Los Angeles said, eh, not so fast. The deal was we took the money from the federal government and we have to use it for public purposes. So the public purpose that they found was wooing a Brooklyn-based baseball club to Los Angeles with a promise of cheap land. Now, what is little known is this area was developed mainly with private money, not the public money. Unlike Arizona, which taxes the crap out of tourists on rental cars to fund their stadiums, but I digress. And ultimately, the whole situation lasted through to the early 60s when the last resident was paid $10,500 for his home, and that's when Dodger Stadium was built. In an interesting turn of events, for five years at the beginning, Dodger Stadium was also the home of the Los Angeles Angels. So this kind of gives you a sense of Chavez Ravine. We were just way up top there, and now we're down in kind of a valley. And Dodger Stadium is just over the hill there. So in and around Chavez Ravine, you've got a uh, Naval Reserve Center, a fire academy, a police academy, uh, and then Dodger Stadium. And then a number of parks. you got a Legion Park up there. So they really did use it for public purposes with one really big private enterprise. So now we're on the other side of where we were before. So we were way up top looking down into Dodger Stadium, kind of the peak, that's Angel's Crest. Now we're getting, actually the really odd thing, on the other side of the stadium, there are two prisons, county and uh, regional detention, detention center. If you tell someone to go to hell, this is about it. Okay, so now we have officially one mile of range remaining. Now when we left Playa, we had 32 miles of range, and we've gone about, I want to say a little over 20 miles because we kind of went the long way to go check out Tesla. So is 32 miles of range an exact science? No, and the reality is none of these cars are an exact science. Whether it's this, the Tesla, the Nissan, I don't care what it is. If they say 100 miles of range, you're probably going to get about, I don't know, 90% of that. It all depends on your driving. Uh, a very good friend of mine has a Tesla, and he, he's, uh, he's funny. He puts it as driving a Tesla long distance is kind of like filing a flight plan. You could think you're going to go, oh, 250 miles in range, but if there's elevation changes, you need to know that. So the 110 freeway dumps us off into downtown Pasadena, and that's where we are right now. So this is the first traffic light since uh, we got on the freeway. So we talked about Chavez Ravine, but we haven't talked about Pasadena. One of the things that Pasadena is really famous for are these cute little craftsman style homes. Like there's one right there. You have more of these than the craftsman homes. Summertime and the living is easy. Okay, so here we are. We've burned up all 32 miles of our range and we are officially in downtown Pasadena. Now on to using this helmet. So click here to watch one of our 250 other episodes. Click here to subscribe. And can we ask you guys a favor? Can you watch these within the first 36 hours? Because it gets us more views, which gets us more dollars, which gets you more episodes. And of course, follow us, Motoman TV, all one word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll see you guys next time.